Thank you, Dr. Pallotta Fontaine. And I want to thank um, the Becker Hawks for inviting me here tonight. And uh, I want to acknowledge before I begin uh, the chairman of your board of directors um, also wanted to acknowledge you and to support your initiative to want to even come to a, an extracurricular uh, talk. So we have Jay DiGeronimo uh, in the back, the chairman of the board of directors of Becker College. And so I want to thank Jay and uh, his wife Gretchen for, for being here today. Um, what I want to talk about includes some of these, and I have 50 minutes. So I usually, uh, when I lecture at Clark University, where I lectured this morning for three hours. Tonight I'll be lecturing again for three hours. But the most important lecture of the day is going to happen right now. Um, because I have 50 minutes to share with you as much information as you can absorb in a very narrow window of time. This lecture probably should take me at least three hours. You get it in 50 minutes. Why? Because you need to know some of the material I'm going to share with you. Why? because it's going to affect you and, more importantly, your children and your grandchildren. It is inescapable. It is certainty. It, it will affect you, and <clears throat> at least we need to begin this dialogue here at Becker. So I want to share with you facts and figures and information about climate change. I want to sh talk to you about ways we can perhaps begin addressing it. And then I'm going to end today's conversation with a challenge just as I did with our first lecture back on the Worcester campus. So are we ready? So let's go. So I want to talk to you about climate change in broad context, facts. I want to talk to you about very alarming issues rel relative to climate change. I want to talk to you about the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change report that's recently out. I want to talk to you about ways we can address climate and why it's so critically important to you. One of, if not the greatest, sources of poverty in this world over the next three to five decades will be caused as a result of climate change. And when climate change occurs, it always trickles down to the bottom of the economic pyramid. Those at the bottom of our economic period in the world, in the United States, in Worcester, will be most affected. And so we all have to be aware of some of these things. And I'm going to end with what Becker can do. All right? Last lecture I gave at, in Worcester, I talked about big contexts. You know, what are the I major issues in the world that we need to talk about? So I talked about the Millennium Development Goals and the more recently passed Sustainable Development Goals. This is the blueprint for the United Nations. The United Nations back in 2000 got together and said, 189 countries, we're in a boatload of trouble. We got issues coming, coming in at us and we don't know what to do, so we're going to create priorities. And they came up with eight. And we have worked for the past 15 years around the world in trying to address eight significant goals. And I'm going to tell you about those in a second. One of those was environmental change and climate change. And now the United Nations has just adopted the Sustainable Development Goals this past September. And that is, establishes our blueprint, our goals for the next 15 years, your sweet spot. Let's say you're all on average maybe 20. This is, this is your sweet spot. There are many that are now saying that you are the generation who will be most affected by all the previous generations that have come before you and are the only generation that have the ability to change what we have left you. So I want you, to, I want you to be with me. I want you to stay focused for just a few minutes. And then when you leave, you can take whatever you want with you. So what, what did we talk about the last lecture? What are some of the big issues? We talked about infectious diseases. 3.2 million people are infected with malaria. Children are dying. Three to 500 million people in 2015 were infected. Uh, most of those occur in one continent. Most of the issues in the world occur in one continent, Africa. Do we have medications that will address <laughs> malaria in the West? Absolutely. It's very cheap. Mm, but those don't get sent to poor and developing countries. How about malnutrition and hunger? Didn't we solve malnutrition and hunger? No. We have a significant problem in malnutrition and hunger in developing countries around the world. I work in eight countries. I see malnutrition and hunger in every one of them. This is alive and well. 
uh, too often. Most of that occurs in South Asia, 40, where 45% of children are undernourished. Creates all sorts of developmental problems and such. How about education? One of the biggest challenges that we have as a, as a world community is to educate our women. There's a great Chinese expression. There's a book written on it called Women Make Up Half the Sky. Half the world is made up of women, yet oftentimes, for lots of cultural and political and other reasons, girls particularly are not afforded a primary education. It becomes more pronounced when you're talking about a secondary education. And so education becomes a world problem that we need to talk about. Not today, but we will in the future. How about um, reproductive and child um, health? Uh, issues of child and maternal mortality are amazing. I work in Sierra Leone. I got back from Sierra Leone and Ghana about a week and a half ago, where we have a medical clinic, we have a birthing clinic, and in the area of Sierra Leone where I work, one in nine women die in childbirth. One in nine, not great odds. And so we work aggressively to try to uh, all, uh, provide prenatal care, perinatal care, obviously, and postnatal care. This is another significant issue in the world, particularly relative to women. And sanitation, 800, to 800 million people do not have access to clean water. Stuff that's in that. Don't have access to it. Two weeks ago, I was standing at a, in a village in a remote part of Sierra Leone, and the water that they drink is filled with sewer, human and animal waste. And there was a stick, and there's a cup, and that's what people drink. And we wonder why we have a high child mortality for children under five and a high maternal mortality, because we don't have enough clean water for about 800 to a billion people on the planet. There are seven billion people on the planet. About a billion don't have access to clean water, and about two billion, over two billion, don't have a toilet. <clears throat> and so they defecate in streams, further exacerbating the clean water problem. These are challenges that we as a world, you as the next generation of leaders in our country and in the world, need to begin thinking about some of these things. Because they're not funny. They don't go away, and unless you deal with them, no one else will. Governments cannot solve all of our problems. They have not solved all of our problems. It's going to require the effort of individual citizens and people like you that want to actually change the world, because I believe you can. You may sit here and think, well, I'm just one student at Becker. What do I know? What can I do? You can do amazing things. Absolutely amazing things, and we can spend time talking about that. And finally, the issues of the environment. We lose about 100 species of flora and fauna, mostly flora, a day. Every day, we lose about 100 species to extinction. Can you get your head around that? Every day, gone forever. CO2 uh, contributes 25% of the CO2 emissions fueling our climate change, a real major problem. That number is escalating, it is not decreasing, and it only continues to create significant problems. Uh, I remember 20 years ago reading articles that there was this magic number called 386 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere was the tipping point. Once we reached that, we couldn't turn back the clock. We, we flew right by 386. There's a website called 386.org. When you leave here today, check it out. Every day I can find out what the average CO2 in the world is in the atmosphere. You know what it was today? 400 and escalating. And it will only continue to rise because of human activity. We have 7 billion people today. In 1900, we had 2 billion. In 1800, we had 1 billion. In your lifetime, you will see a planet of up to 11 billion people, all needing clean water, food, education, resources, that the world may not be able to make available on an equitable basis. The United States alone consumes 25% of the world's energy on 400 million people. We have 7 billion. 
What do you think China and India are now saying? We want what you've had, and we will take it. So we have an array of issues in terms of our environment to be concerned with, but there may be ways to solve this. So these are the Millennium Development Goals. I'm not going to go through them, uh, but it gives you context again as to where the environment and climate change fits in our discussion today. The first was to eradicate poverty and hunger. The second is universal primary education for girls, promoting gender equality, reducing child mortality, which was incredibly high, improving maternal health, combating uh, malaria and AIDS. We now have Zika, and there will be more. Uh, we had Ebola, uh, and, and we predicted that there would be more of those. You're going to see more and more and more pandemics and epidemics around the world. Why? Because the world is getting warm. We've had, we've had Zika since 1947, where it began in Uganda. And it lied fairly dormant, not a big deal. Suddenly, in the last three to four years, as the climate is really heating up, 2015 was the hottest year in recorded history. 2014, before that, was the previously highest recorded season on record. Zika is emerging and, and other issues of pandemic or viruses will emerge as our climate warms. We have to be cognizant of that, prepared for it, and do whatever we can to prevent it from happening. So we've made big progress in trying to alleviate lots of social issues around the world. We've uh, done good, uh, made good progress on making available clean water, not enough made good progress. Primary education for girls is now almost equal to boys, not secondary ed, but primary ed. So we've made significant progress, but not enough, particularly in the area of the environment where it's actually gotten worse. So that's when the UN came together and said, last year, we need, we need to create not eight, we need to create 17 more goals. And three of those relate to the environment. So it's this broad concept of, of the environment that I want to talk about briefly today and offer some solutions, possible solutions. Deforestation continues between 1990 and 2013. 4% of the world's forests, gone. Not temporarily, you know, on vacation, gone. A major CO2 sink is gone in a period of 20 years. Tree plantations are increasing while old forests, including in our southwest, or our northwest territories in the United States, old forests gone. We're cutting them down. Tree plantations, uh, despite increased efforts, uh, conservation, we're losing all these species every day. Fish in the ocean. <clears throat> we almost have no fish left in terms of big, big, big fish. You see that uh, show on TV, Wicked Tuna? You know, every time they catch a tuna, it's 10 grand for a fish. Why? Because we don't have very many left. And that will continue in the next decade. Greenhouse gas emissions is increasing. They're not decreasing. They're significantly increasing due to population, due to industrialization, due to a number of other factors, which exacerbates climate change. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the science is now unequivocal. Human activities are driving changes in the Earth's climate and with subsequent risks to human well-being. Many scientists are suggesting, not all, that we may have already reached the tipping point. The genie may be out of the bottle. We may not be able to completely turn this around, but there is still hope. Global effort to eliminate ozones has worked. Uh, CFCs, we've eliminated. But half the world doesn't have sanitation or clean water. Another environmental crisis, particularly in developing countries. 90% of the future growth between 7 and 9 billion people is going to occur on one continent in the next 30 years. One continent, Africa. Why? We have lots of young people. A whole host of young people. 
Africa is about to explode. And when that happens, we all have to be a little bit wary of geopolitical issues, of demands, of requests. People want what everyone else has. We all want to live equitable lives. But the Gini coefficient, the, the delta between the rich and the poor, it continues to escalate. And when that delta becomes too great, people get angry. And they do what they have to do to feed their children. Rapid expansion of cities. Ah, 2005, one out of three urban dwellers was living in slums. Number of urban dwellers will continue to expand from 3.9 billion uh, people today. In 2030, 14 years from today, we will have nearly 6 billion people living in major cities. Last year was the first time in recorded history that the number of people living in cities have finally surpassed the number of people living in rural areas. So you're going to see major cities of 30, 40, 50 million people. And that won't be uncommon. How do you possibly police, govern, educate, provide water, shelter, uh, food for 40 or 50 million people in one concentrated area? You're going to have to figure that out. The environment, I've mentioned this, 25% of the CO2 emissions fueling climate uh, is creating all sorts of mass flooding, famine, water shortages, and people in the developed world, you and I, need to take responsibility. And so there are going to be extraordinary demands on you over the next generation. Um, and that's unfortunate. Uh, sanitation water, we've talked about. Access to safe water is a fundamental human need. Kofi Annan, former Secretary of the United Nations. Some basic facts about climate change. Uh, can you see that all right? 97% of climate scientists agree that man-made pollution um, is warming our climate. There are still a couple of people around that don't believe it. One happens to be the House Chairman of uh, the Environmental Affairs in, in the United States, Congress. Uh, he's a, a congressman who does not believe in climate change. He thinks it's some right-wing conspiracy by President Obama. Um, he's wrong, of course. The science is clear. Um, but yet, we're going to have to be careful of things like that. Carbon pollution from the fossil fuel industry is now at an all-time high. We have more CO2 in the atmosphere today than we've had in human history. And the trending is not looking good. Why? Too many people, a lot of people, a lot of industrialization, a lot of people in developing countries like China, India, and Brazil want exactly what the West has always had, stuff. And they're producing a lot of material. They also, almost comically, have decided they love hamburgers. I could spend a, an hour talking to you about the carbon price of a hamburger to produce beef Cows, enormously expensive in terms of CO2, as opposed to um, pork or lamb or other meat products. And because China and India are beginning to have a taste for beef, we're having tremendous new spews of methane in the atmosphere, even more harmful than CO2. Carbon pollution stays in the atmosphere and it traps uh, more of the sun's heat. That's the greenhouse effect. And both carbon levels and global temperatures have increased dramatically since the Industrial Revolution. That, um, I don't know if this is a, that little marker right there is the increase in CO2. So you can now begin to see that level of trajectory. It is now past 400. That's that's what we're living with right now. That's the problem. That's not sustainable. Uh, warming atmosphere leads to more extreme weather. So in some parts of the world, you're going to see more rain. In other parts of the world, because warm temperature holds more moisture. So in some parts of the world, you're going to see a lot of wet weather, a lot of flooding, a lot of crisis. And in other parts of the world, it's going to get very dry. 
Uh, did you know that um, underneath the ground in Texas and throughout our middle country, Colorado, Utah, do you know what was under that decades, not eons ago, epochs ago? It was an ocean. So if you go to parts of West Texas, up through Oklahoma, Utah, um, maybe about six, seven inches below the topsoil, it's all sand. And many scientists are beginning to get really concerned because we have a drought in the Midwest. And once we have a drought, you have um, the topsoil blows away. And suddenly we're going to possibly see an ocean of sand in the Midwest. And if that happens, we have a real problem growing crops. Uh, water temperatures cause glaciers to melt, which causes sea levels to rise on the west coast of Greenland. We are losing that swath of glaciers. If we lose the Greenland ice sheet, water rises nine, nine meters, approximately 21 feet. And I would love to be able to show you video right now of what's happening right now on the Greenland ice sheet because of global warming. We are losing the Greenland ice sheet, the west coast of Greenland. And when that happens, we, uh, we're in trouble because that Greenland ice sheet absorbs uh, much of, our, of, of the heat that comes into the uh, atmosphere. We need to control that. And yet it's, it's calving off into the, uh, into the ocean. Our temperature on pace to rise 4 degrees Celsius by 2100, and to avoid that, we're trying to keep it at 2 degrees Celsius. We've already increased temperatures by 2015. We're up by about 1 degree Celsius. <clears throat> Some scientists will say 0.9. Others have now say, no, it, it hit 1 degree Celsius. We hit uh, 2 degrees Celsius, it, life changes. We hit 3 and 4 degrees Celsius, life as we know it may may be changed dramatically. This is not 300 years from today. It is not a possibility. It's a probability. And you need to know that so that we can begin doing things differently. Uh, good news, by switching to clean energy technologies, we can get the energy we need uh, without heating our planet. We need to very quickly move to clean energies. Solar, wind, tidal wave um, energy production, and we need to do it fast. How many solar panels do we have here at Becker College? Okay. So there'll be some that will deny. Big polluters deny. The oil industry will say, no, 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 there's no such thing as global warming. Same people who ran uh, the tobacco industry did, uh, did that with tobacco. No, 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 tobacco doesn't cause any problems at all. Well, it does. And what we need to do is make sure that we um, call out big polluters and ask, what are you doing? You're affecting me and the lives of my children in the future. And no longer allow deniers to say that it doesn't exist. It does. The Pope is now speaking about it. COP21 in Paris brought together over 150 presidents or comparable uh, members of government together in one room. We've never done that. Why do you think all of these presidents and all of these major nations got together to have a, a nice little cocktail together? They came together because they've recognized something that they can no longer escape from. If we as leaders of countries, including President Obama, if we do not act right now and quickly, you, our next generation, is going to be left with a really big mess. And so you have everyone from the Pope to the President to world leaders across the world and across the globe saying, this is the biggest issue we need to deal with. There is no other issue that takes such precedent Yes, we need to deal with education, health care, and, and uh, maternal and child care, and uh, child, uh, uh, mortality and various things. But MDG number seven, our global climate change issue, is, is um, 
preeminent. It has to be dealt with. So what can we do? Well, we can get involved. We can all get involved. So y'all gonna leave here, you know, most of you will say, well, it's, you know, maybe it's a little interesting. Maybe I got a few facts. Um, I'm hoping that 10 of you walk out of the room with some more information about how perilous we are. And I'm not a negative person. I'm an incredible optimist. That's why I do, uh, that's why I teach. That's why I love teaching. That's why I travel the world. I don't do it because I'm a pessimist. I'm so optimistic because of you. My generation left you a big problem. Now we work, need to work together to help solve it, and you have to get involved. Uh, some other facts. Human population. 10,000 generations it took to reach 2 billion people. From the beginning of man to 1900, we hit 2 billion people. In 112 years, we went from 2 billion to 7 billion. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the trajectory. Is that big spike in the right? It's going up. And the question is, can we control that? Because that affects the environment. That affects the quality of your life. That affects whether or not we're going to live in a world that we're now comfortable with in the next 40, 50 years. I'm not talking 200 years. I'm talking in the next 20, 30, 40 years. That's a fact. We have to deal with that. Global warming is real. There's no question about it in Europe, South America, Africa, Australia, Asia, everywhere in the world where climate records are kept have indicated a significant rise in both ocean temperatures and um, air temperatures. And it's not going down, it's not leveling off. It continues to increase. Uh, up to half the Earth's forests that originally covered the Earth are gone. One third of the Earth's land surface is threatened by desertification. And that continues. While the Earth gets warmer, we, uh, we face the challenge of losing a lot of arable land. As the Earth gets warmer, we have an increasing rise in sea levels. It's only very recognizable if you happen to live at sea level. If you're in Worcester, you don't really notice it, right? We're not at sea level. Go to the Maldives, where I was three years ago. Um, go to Bangladesh. I was in Bangladesh three times this past year, 2015. First meeting with Muhammad Yunus, then bringing Becker to Muhammad Yunus, and then finally meeting with him again. Bangladesh is, um, sh is sinking. Land that is used for rice production is becoming saline on a daily basis. They are losing hectares of land annually. 160 million people in the size of the state of Utah are being compressed. Bangladesh now cannot produce enough rice in their country to feed their population. They're being forced to sell it on the open market for liquid cash and then buy it on the open market for a higher price. Doesn't make sense. But this is what's happening in Bangladesh and that's why I'm there. A Couple of uh, pictures. Uh, this is Glacier National Park on the top in 1932. Glacier National Park here in the United States. That's what it looked like in 1932. This is what it looked like in 1988. In 2015, there are no glaciers in Glacier National Park. None. Zero. Gone. How about Peru? 1980. Huge glaciers in Peru. 2002, receding dramatically. 2015, pretty much gone. Small remnants of it. Glaciers in Peru disappearing. How about Mount Kilimanjaro? I was in uh, Ethiopia uh, a couple of years ago and uh, flew over Mount Kilimanjaro. I was fascinated. I wanted to see the snow because I had heard that it was retreating. Well, there's no more snow uh, at the time, times of the year on Mount Kilimanjaro. Gone. That's what it looked like in 1970. Famous book, what, John Steinbeck, Snows of Kilimanjaro, I think, John Steinbeck. 
Uh, Kilimanjaro in 2000, 2012 when I was there, there was no snow during that time of year. Um, how about Nepal? Uh, major glaciers in Nepal, uh, 2004, retreated up the mountain, 2015, that glacier is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. A major problem because people south of Nepal and into India rely upon those glaciers for water. And when those glaciers dry up, there's no fresh water coming down. That's a challenge. So we have significant environmental destructions everywhere. This is the polar ice cap, 1979-2003. Uh, the most recent um, NASA photographs suggest that we can, in the summer months, for the first time in human history, circumnavigate North America. You know, the Northwest Passage is now available during summer months because we have a retreating Arctic ice cap. Uh, it's a major challenge. Uh, you like polar bears? Particularly ones in the wild? If you want to see one in the wild, you better go now. I suspect within the next 30 years there will be no more live wild polar bears. You'll be able to see them in the, in the zoo. And 50, 60 years from today, you can tell your children there used to be them. They used to run wild. There may not be any polar bears in the next 30 to 40 years. That's, <coughs> that's the CO2 increase. That's the trajectory. Uh, just look at the trajectory and you can see how fast that's going up. Uh, we talked about the loss of billions of tons of fertile soil. Uh, four tons of soil per person was lost last year. Almost half of humanity lives on less than $2 a day. That's a problem. You have lots of poor people that are going to be significantly impacted and made poorer by climate change. Category 4 and 5 hurricanes have nearly doubled in the last 4 or 5 years. Hurricane Sandy here in the East Coast I think cost us $85 billion. Uh, malaria spread to the Colombian Andes. Malaria. Uh, ice flow from uh, glaciers in Greenland has more than doubled over the past decade, meaning we're losing all sorts of, of um, shelf ice from Greenland. And uh, animals are already responding to global warming. Lots of animals. Uh, global sea levels, I mentioned, if we lose Greenland, will rise up to 20 feet, 21 feet, 9, nine meters. Uh, that's a certainty. It's already been measured out. People are sort of planning on it. So you live in New York and Boston. Miami, perhaps, uh, Chittagong, uh, Bangladesh, other major cities that, that are on the ocean. You may want to think about buying property a little bit inland because you'll soon have uh, oceanfront property. Heat waves are more frequent, particularly in places like Australia, and droughts and wildfires are occurring all over. More than a million species worldwide could be uh, extinct by 2050. Fishing, 90% of the large fish in the world's office are already, uh, world's oceans are already on. 90% of the large fish in the world's oceans are already gone. Gone. Never to come back. And that's with a population of 6 and 7 billion. Can you imagine what will happen in the next 30 years? Dead zones, uh, there are at least, now there are 149 dead zones in the world's oceans, meaning there are big swaths of, of area in particularly the Pacific that are now basically dead. There are no plankton that grow, which are the basis for food for many of our species that live in the oceans. 149 dead zones the size of Rhode Island are throughout basically the Pacific, and they're increasing. They're filled with lots of plastic water bottles, a number of other things. Let me just skip through some of these things. Uh, obviously, we can't allow this to happen. We have to keep moving. We have to work on things. When I fly over Haiti, anyone from Haiti? Anyone been to Haiti? Be like Brit, sure, a lot of programs. Well, if you look down at the island of Espanola, you look down, uh, Dominican Republic is green, Haiti is brown. Why? Lack of economic development. And then Haitians have to then use their uh, environment to produce uh, fire. They cut down trees. In uh, Dominican Republic, they created an economic engine based upon 
travel and tourism. Let me show you something really quick. This is a, uh, a, uh, an article that just came out in the Guardian magazine a um, couple of, maybe about a couple of months ago. And I, I won't show you the article, but I wanted to point it out. Look at it. it it's absolutely um, frightening. Uh, they're suggesting that the Earth is on the brink of its first mass extinction, a sixth mass extinction in the world. Uh, scientists around the world have gotten together and basically are saying, we are at the edge of another mass extinction, meaning the loss of flora fauna uh, throughout the globe in a significant way once we reach this environmental <coughs> tipping point. Not that maybe, the issue is we probably will lose hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of species over the next 20 years. And this is uh, The Guardian, well-respected organization that is now talking about this. So I'll leave that on the site and you can look it up yourself. There's a book recently came out in 2014 by Elizabeth Colbert called The Sixth Extinction and she suggests the same thing, that there have been five massive extinctions since the dawn of, of the world and we are, at the, we are at the edge of the sixth. Scientists around the world are now suggesting something called the Anthropocene Epoch meaning that we're now entering a new epoch of history, of global history, in which man's impact upon the world is so severe, circa, some argue 1800s, some argue mid-1900s, uh, mid uh, that it is now going to reshape our future as a global community. Fascinating discussions by many scientists around the world trying to actually determine a new epoch of time. This is not a small issue. This is a big, big issue. So what we need to do is try to find that balance. Sustainable development, the balance between our economic needs and desires, our social and our community desires and needs to live a decent life, and balancing our nature and environment, and that's a quality of life. When you have a dysfunction or an imbalance in those vectors, we have problems. And that's where sustainable development comes into play. The next few slides are drawn from a presentation given at the Kyoto Accord meetings in Japan back in 2013, uh, 2003. We were already talking about this in, back in actually the 1980s when Jim uh, Hansen at uh, NASA began to ring this bell saying, hey everybody, we got problems, and nobody wanted to listen. And then suddenly we had Kyoto, and the world began to say, hmm, we do have problems. And people get, began to talk about sustainable development for business. Let's get the private sector involved with us so that they can develop things in a sustainable way. The United States was the significant Western power that did not sign the Kyoto Accords. Why? Because it would have influenced our economic development. Manufacturers of cars and other products here in the States didn't want us to sign the Kyoto Accords, and we didn't. And that probably will be one of the biggest black eyes or shames that we will have ever instituted on ourselves by not saying to the world, we agree, we need to do something. Now, President Obama has done a complete about-face, of course. He's saying, we're going to do a lot because we have no more options. The time is over. It's a great uh, term in psychology called cognitive dissonance. You know, psychology majors in the room? Cognitive dissonance is, an issue, is, is what we do when there's an issue that's so big, so distressing, so upsetting, we can't get our head around it, so we don't want to deal with it. We pretend it doesn't exist. Cognitive dissonance. And we have, for years and decades, approached the problems of our environment in a similar way. It's too big. It's too frightening. Too scary. Let's not think about it. Why environmental responsibility? We have limited resources. Um, do you know how many years left we have of oil in the ground? Of known oil reserves in the ground? 30. We have 30 years of known oil around the world in the ground. 
How old are you now? 20? By the time you're 50, I don't know, you better have a solar-powered car because we're not going to have a lot of oil left. We do have shale and we do have coal and those will last for a long time. Are they economically beneficial? I mean, uh, environmentally beneficial to us? No, nor is oil. But we've only got 30 years left. That's it. We can't make any more oil. 30. Natural resource uh, uh, degradation is significant and all the loss of our biodiversity. So Jim Hansen, uh, the warming that we've seen in the last 30 years is clearly due to human-made greenhouse gases, which continue. Let me show you a quick little video clip. So now in the summer, we can actually circumnavigate North America. It's all the land that we would lose.
Notice how quickly things are changing. Some facts, quick facts about the alarming facts around climate change. Every day in the United States we produce enough trash to equal the weight of the entire Empire State Building. Uh, the amount of wood and paper we throw away each year is uh, enough to heat uh, 50 million homes for 20 years. How about each year we lose 40 million acres of forest through logging and land clearing? We're shooting ourselves in the foot by clearing land. Why do we clear land? Because we have a growing population that needs to grow food. We have a virtuous cycle. Unfortunately, it's not very virtuous. Rainforests have taken thousands of years to form, but every second a portion of the size of a football field is destroyed. One, two, three. Gone, gone, never to come back. 50 to 100 species of plants become extinct every day. The balance are fauna. 30% of fish stock have already collapsed or gone, 30%. Big fish pretty much have been decimated. So you're going to be eating in the future small fish, fish that may be junk fish considered today, but uh, big tuna, sailfish, sunfish, not so much. This is not speculation. You read about, if you live in New England, all you have to do is every once in a while read the paper about the fishermen out of Gloucester and, and other parts of uh, fishing industry here in New England who are being asked not to fish anymore and are giving up their livelihoods. Why? We can't sustain the fish stock. How about fishless oceans could become a reality by 2050? Oceans without any fish partly due to, to global warming and the warming of our ocean's waters. Which also, by the way, anyone ever been to Australia? You know, the Great Barrier Reef, north uh, eastern section of uh, Australia. Uh, scientists tell us they can actually see it from space. It is today bleaching out, meaning it's, it's dying. Why? Because coral does not grow in temp water temperature greater than 86 degrees and we have an escalating water temperature uh, throughout the world, but particularly in the uh, Australia area. And so coral is dying. The Caribbean, go to the Caribbean. You'll see lots of bleaching, it's called, of coral in the Caribbean. Why? Water's reaching uh, 86 degrees and above. Uh, every year we extract 55 billion tons of fossil energy, metal, and minerals. That's 10 tons for every person in the world we're taking from the earth. How about in developing countries, 90% of the sewer, human waste, 90% goes in rivers and in open water sources. So where I work, if you happen to be in village A on a river, you're in good shape because you drink water at that river, you wash your clothes, uh, and you defecate. If you happen to be village 20, the water you're drinking comes down through village 1 through 19. You're drinking water basically filled with fecal material. And that's a reality in far too many parts of the globe. 70% um, of industrial race in developing countries is discharged into waterways. No treatment. Um, beef. Let me talk about hamburgers again. Giving up beef will reduce carbon footprints more than, ca more than cars. Compared to chicken or pork, beef requires 20 times more land to produce, 11 times more water, and 5 times more climate warming emissions for beef. Why? They um, flagellate methane. Methane, very damaging to the environment, even more so than CO2. And the world is beginning to want more beef. We all like hamburgers. So does the developing world. That's a problem. How about dark snow? And uh, throughout Greenland, if you go to Greenland or look at film of the Greenland ice sheet, it's all black. And one wonders, why is it black? That's pollution. And as the Greenland ice sheet becomes black, it absorbs more heat. More heat exacerbates melting. 
And so we have pollution coming in from all over the world, but particularly recently in the developing areas of China. And that uh, pollution catches the jet stream and ends up uh, in places like Greenland. Pacific storms are getting stronger than ever. And obviously, it's up to us. We can't any longer point any, any other direction. I'll show you another quick little video. It's like everything you know and love, you just see it gets swept away in a matter of hours. The wind is just shifting continuously. I've gone through several years like this, but not this long and not this broad. So this is the cost of carbon pollution. We may not realize it, but climate change is affecting us, all of us, right now. We're seeing it all over the news, from the bottom of the oceans to the tops of the mountains, and in the faces of victims across the globe. How did we get here? Let's start at the beginning. It's 1824, and French physicist Joseph Fourier uses a vase and some cork to figure out that there's an atmosphere trapping heat and making the Earth habitable. Right about this time, we also hit the Industrial Revolution, the birth of large-scale manufacturing and coal power, and the beginning of the carbon boom. 1896 rolls around, and a couple scientists figure out that CO2 from burning all that oil and coal could affect global temperatures. Their numbers based on these fuel consumption rates showed that we had a few thousand years before we had to worry. So we didn't. Yippee. Then the 1960s came and things started getting ugly. No, worse. Charles Keeling had captured enough data to determine that carbon levels in the air were directly related to the amount of fossil fuel burned and that levels were going up. In 2010, NASA declared 2000 to 2009 the warmest decade on record. But hey, what does NASA know? One small step for man. Oh yeah, that. And that's sort of the way it's gone. Which brings us to today. Today we live in a world of extreme erratic weather. And here's the kicker. It's costing us big time right now. In 2013, insurance losses from flooding in Central Europe were estimated at $3.9 billion. In Australia, the 2013 Denali fire alone cost roughly $87 million. And these costs don't just end with the massive damage control bills. The effects ripple through our lives, costing us in other ways. Take Hurricane Sandy, for example. The initial damages cost roughly $65 billion. But what about the small business owners that either lost merchandise, customers, or their entire business because of flooding? And it's not just money. Some of us are paying with lives and livelihood. Others are paying in pain, damage, and suffering. In fact, the climate crisis is recognized as one of the world's leading threats to political stability and national security. The point is, we are all paying today for carbon pollution. Every one of us. We're paying in dollars, in lives, in jobs, in lifestyles, and in every way imaginable. This is not a theory. It's not an opinion. This is the cost of carbon. I'm going to move very quickly now. I, I really wish I had three hours with you. I got seven more minutes. So let me try to throw some additional stuff at you. I'm not going to go through this. This is the international panel, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change. If you want facts and figures, real detail, if you're a scientist, you like data, go to the Interne intergovernmental panel on climate change. Read their facts. Uh, human influence on climate change system is clear. It's not any longer conjecture. Uh, warming of the climate is unequivocal, and since the 1950s, many observed changes are unprecedented, unprecedented over decades of time. The rate of sea level rise uh, since the mid-19th uh, century has been larger than the mean rate during the previous two millennia. Seas are rising. Uh, continued emission of greenhouse gases will call further warming and changes in all components of the climate system. It's likely that the Arctic sea ice cover will continue to shrink and thin and that the northern hemisphere spring snow cover will decrease during this century. That's, that's the d last death row. That happens. Get ready. That's the spike in CO2. 
Uh, below is the, the top one is the increase in ocean temperatures worldwide. It's going up. The uh, figure on the left is uh, the, um, the change in average surface temperature between 1986 and 2005. And 2080 to 2100, that's what it's going to look like. In 2080, our world is going to be really hot. We're going to have really hot weather. And below, it talks about the changes in precipitation. Some areas of the globe are going to increase precipitation. Most areas of the globe are going to lose precipitation and become desertified. And if we lose our middle belt where we grow wheat and corn in this country and becomes a desert as it once was, hmm, we don't become the breadbasket of the world anymore. We may have problems feeding ourselves. This lasts two minutes, so I'm, I'm going to do this fast. 2015, hottest year in record. Science. Earth has just experienced the hottest year since records began, according to a report by the United Nations. Greenhouse gases are behind the trend, believe most scientists. Researchers have also taken into account factors such as a powerful El Nino, that's the band of warm ocean water and wind, which can spark an increase in temperatures across the world. 2015 would have been the warmest year on record without El Nino, but the occurrence of El Nino at the same time, starting in late 2015, pushed the, the global temperatures even slightly higher than they would have been. The UN World Meteorological Organization report confirms findings by NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration showing that for the first time on record, Temperatures in 2015 were about one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial era. We've just a year ago, scientists said that was impossible to happen. We weren't going to hit it. We're now years, one degree Celsius warmer. There is no pause in global warming. A warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor and causes an intensification of rainstorms and is also at the origin of other powerful weather events. In general terms, say that as a result of climate change, we do expect uh, extreme events like heat waves, like heavy rainfall to, to, to increase. We really need to stay, to keep those temperature increases below a maximum, an absolute maximum of two degrees Celsius, um, you know, to stand a, 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 a good chance of, um, you know, of being able to survive as we, as we are today. At the Paris summit in December, 195 nations signed an accord to limit the increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. UN experts say the limit is a significant defense line against the impact of climate change. Okay, I'm going to move right to the end of my presentation. Uh, these are the M uh, SDG goals for climate issues. You can read those. Uh, this PowerPoint will be available on the Becker site. You can look through it if you wish. Use it if you wish. Share it with your friends. Do whatever you want with it, but spread the word. Um, ten ways to save the earth. Let's, let's talk about some solutions, quick ones. One is save water, save a life. I have a student at Clark University last year that told me she takes an hour shower every day. One hour in the shower. And her, my, her response to my question about that was, well, you know, I pay tuition and I get to use it, hot water as much as I want. Good Lord, if we all did that, we'd be consuming so much energy, more than we have today, and it all contributes to CO2. So saving water, taking a quicker shower, bath, showers instead of baths, fixing leaking faucets, saving our animals, another important uh, environmental issue. We need to maintain our biodiversity on the planet. Without it, we become diminished. How about choosing renewable energy? It's my understanding that Becker is moving toward renewable energy soon. It's a great sign. We need to do more of it. As you maintain or acquire your own homes, think about renewable energy as a source of electricity. Uh, use paper less. Um, destroying paper costs a tree, et cetera, et cetera. You know all about that. Try to become paperless as much as possible. Ban the use of plastic bags, and I will say plastic bottles. Plastic is not biodegradable. It sits around for decades, clogging up all sorts of things, land, uh, uh, land fills, et cetera, et cetera. We have problems. Plastic bag, same thing. 
Avoid them if possible, if you want to do something small. Recycle glass. Plant trees. Turn off lights and save energy when you don't need them. Walk more, drive less. All issues, I'm not going to show you this. Bill Gates is so concerned, he's now pledging billions of dollars after COP21, the Paris Accords. He's now determined that he's going to be focusing almost entirely his wealth on trying to rectify and create new technologies to rectify some of the global climate changes that we're seeing in the world today. Billions of dollars. So, last few slides. So this is what you all have done. So I've asked the question, what is Becker doing? What is our own college doing in terms of energy? This is what I got. We converted five boilers to gas-fired. We replaced five uh, oil-fired boilers to gas-fired boilers. 75% of the lights on campus have been moved to LEDs. Uh, we added 12 inches of insulation to some of our buildings, many of our buildings. We're working on new water treatment. That's good. We replaced four roofs. Uh, this is the big one. By the end of 16, the college received 95% of its electricity by energy. Did you know that? Solar power? Wonderful, wonderful start. The rest? Okay. The last one makes sense. And so what can you do at Becker? Last couple of slides. Stay with me. Becker is one of the few colleges and universities that I speak at or know that does not have a sustainable energy initiative. You have no climate initiative program. You have um, no effort to organize um, uh, sustainability on campus. Now, I'm not saying that as a criticism. I love Becker. It's just something you haven't gotten to yet. And I'm going to challenge you to do it. We need to have at Becker a concerted effort to save energy and reduce our carbon footprint. And how do you do that? There are already tools that universities all over this country are using. One is called STARS, put out by the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. Clark is a member, a number of organizations, colleges and universities are members. You can become one. You guys at, at Clark, are, at Becker, are one of the most engaged groups of, of young people I've ever met. And yet we have nothing around environmental sustainability. Let's do something. Create a student faculty environmental stewardship committee. Create a climate action plan. And if you go to that website, I give you a sample of one from the University of Washington. There are plenty of samples. You don't have to recreate anything. Just do something. And I want to end my comments with President Obama. Why? Because I'm a big admirer and I think what he said at his State of the Union address made good sense. Let me end with this. Two thousand fourteen was the planet's warmest year on record. Now one year doesn't make a trend, but this does. Fourteen of the fifteen warmest years on record have all fallen in the first fifteen years of this century. I've heard some folks try to dodge the evidence by saying they're not scientists, that we don't have enough information to act. Well, I'm not a scientist either. But you know what? I know a lot of really good scientists at NASA and at NOAA and at our major universities. And the best scientists in the world are all telling us that our activities are changing the climate. And if we don't act forcefully, we'll continue to see rising oceans, longer, hotter heat waves, dangerous droughts and floods, and massive disruptions that can trigger greater migration and conflict and hunger around the globe. The Pentagon says that climate change poses immediate risks to our national security. We should act like it. And that's why... That's why over the past six years, we've done more than ever to, to combat climate change from the way we produce energy to the way we use it. That's why we've set aside more public lands and waters than any administration in history. And that's why I will not let this Congress endanger the health of our children by turning back the clock on our efforts. I am determined to make sure 
that American leadership drives international action. In Beijing, we made a historic announcement. The United States will double the pace at which we cut carbon pollution, and China committed for the first time to limiting their emissions. And because the world's two largest economies came together, other nations are now stepping up and offering hope that this year, the world will finally reach an agreement to protect the one planet we've got. Why do we talk about environment at the UNICENTER discussion? Why is this part of it? Because this is what I believe the UNICENTER Center should be doing on this campus. The UNICENTER Center here at Becker will be the first in the United States sanctioned UNICENTER. Center. There are only 17 in the world. We have this opportunity, this great opportunity, to become a forum for great thinkers, students, faculty, business leaders, which are needed, government officials, to come together and talk about significant seminal issues that your world needs to address, or at the very least, be aware of. And so my first lecture a few months ago here at Becker was intended to sort of set a broad stage. And the next three, including this one, will be to focus in on very specific social issues that we can innovate, that we can begin to change. But we begin that process by awareness. Ignorance is bliss but it will not solve our, our world's issues and the need for creative disruption and social innovation. You are the generation that's going to change this. There is nobody else. You are alone, and I'm sorry to say that. You can change the world. You must try. And we can start today here at Becker in small ways, some of the things we've talked about. I hope that a month from today or prior to uh, maybe the beginning of the fall, a group of you will in fact create a student faculty environmental sustainability initiative. You deserve it. You need it. We have to lead. You either lead, follow, or get out of the way. And uh, as far as I have always known, Becker has been a leader. And you as students have been leading many issues from global citizenship to the various programs that you have here. Lead this one thing, I beg you. Create a sustainability plan brought together by students and faculty so that we can measure our CO2 output and demonstrate it to other universities and colleges across the country. So I want to thank you very much for your patience, for your attention. Um, it's been my honor. I love, uh, I love coming here and speaking. And I look forward to my next uh, opportunity to share more thoughts with you on other topics later on. Thank you.